Welcome to episode 49 uh, on Zechariah, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the full restoration of Israel. Now that's a mouthful. How in the world do we go there? I'm Farrell. And I'm Rhonda Pickering. And welcome. We just are really happy to be here. Don't forget, we just really appreciate when you help us. And besides that, I hope it blesses you that you help us with our books. So anytime you are into our stuff and you go to our website, we have all the Isaiah classes that Rhonda put up, like 30 of them. And then our new book, you know, bless us and bless you by supporting us that way. And always give us a like. We appreciate your support. So, jumping right in. <clears throat> so an angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. So he's telling us right out of the gate that, that those are he kind of favors these two locations for whatever reasons. Well, uh, and also with the jealousy that, that it means it's something that belongs to you. It, it, yeah, it's, and you don't want it to, to waver out there and exactly, deviate exactly. out. Yeah, it's like you would for your family. You, 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 there's a righteous jealousy, and that's over those that are in covenant with you. I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at the ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. So he's telling us there that the heathens are the countries around that kind of divided Jerusalem and sent them into the diaspora. And he's telling us here in the beginning of Zechariah, he's telling us that he wants, you know, he's not going to be happy with them the whole time, even though they did a purpose for him in kind of chasing him. Israel, he's saying, hey, you're not going to get away with this forever. And we kind of talked about that in previous episodes. Right. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and the line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. So he's saying the temple's going to be restored, and that stretching forth a line means he's going to define it. Well, define it, and also in the scriptures, when like when an angel measures the yeah, temple we're courts about to go there. in Ezekiel, yeah. that means that they're protected. Yeah, it, well, it's defined. These are my borders. Right. Don't right. don't inflict and, upon this. You know. And he actually, in in uh, in Revelation, it actually says, and don't measure the courts that are without because they're going to get trodden down. They're not protected. Right. Right. And we're going to kind of go there a little. Okay. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My city, though prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. So he's saying, Hey, Jerusalem, you're coming back. Now, we've already seen the restoration of, of Israel to a large degree, but, but there's still a major ingredient missing, and what's that? Well, the land. The temple. Too. And the temple. The temple primarily, but the and the, the risen... temple because they don't have the land yeah. for the temple, right? Exactly. So the, the, there's things still withheld that Israel does not have in its restoration yet. Okay, so when we go to Zechariah one eighteen, he starts to talk about these horns and carpenters, and we're gonna get into that just a little. Then I lifted up my eyes and I saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto these, to the angel that talked with me, what are these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Now that's kind of weird. Well, let's hit the four horns first. So what are the four horns? Well, horns usually indicate power centers and right, authority. Like the horns of an ox. So, you know, when you go back to Daniel 8 and Daniel 7, you realize that the four horns that scattered Israel were actually in Daniel 8, even though this says Daniel 7. And I, I just wanted to be clear that those four horns were actually, that helped in the scattering of Israel was Babylon, the Medial Persian Empire, and the Greeks, and the Romans. In fact, Israel was completely scattered during the Roman Empire. It was just scattered abroad in many ways. <clears throat> but then it says, and the Lord showed me four carpenters. Now that word, carpenters, 
is kind of like tradesmen, kind of like professionals in their in their duties and what they do. And so um, it's kind of weird to see carpenters in the scriptures that way. But in essence, it's it's referring to someone who has skill in in putting things together or accomplishing things. And well, and also as as you speak of four horns that scatter them. Um, I, I think that, and these four horns, we can actually name the nations right. that scattered them. I think these four carpenters are just as real. These are, these are entities in the end time that will be effectively regathering Israel. Which is fascinating. You could go, now we could actually go to Daniel 7 and you realize if you watched one vision and uh, two or three episodes ago, you realize that the four um, kingdoms that, in a way, kind of help gather Israel back right. are England. Believe it or not, England had a lot to do with Israel becoming a nation again. It, it had the Belford Agreement in 1917, and then we had the United Nations actually set Israel aside to be a, a place for the Jews. It was really more America, but but it, the United Nations was kind of governed by America at that time. It's not well, so much anymore. But and the point would be that, that that these are are symbolic of very real events and very yes. real things. And the the main theme here being as that as they were scattered in the end time, they're regathered and and that is your grand theme in all of your restoration millennial passages and some of that gathering is just like the scattering the scattering was done through war and the gathering is being done through war yeah as a matter of fact when you think about it when has israel ever gathered it has been the result of wars of wars absolutely the first world war and the second world war and we're probably seeing a whole lot of gathering to Israel now with the Ukraine situation where a lot of the of the Jewish people are moving out of the Ukraine and going to Israel. Then I said, what come these to do? And he spake, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man lift up his head. That's the original four horns. But these, the second ones, the carpenters, these are they that come to fray them to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horns over the land of Judah to scatter it. Now that's a mouthful. So he's saying these tradesmen, their purpose is to cast the Gentiles out of the land. Now that's an interesting concept. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, so what are, what are these horns? And I'm at. It reminds me of Micah when when we were reading about the seven shepherds and the eight principal men. You know, these are there. There is so much symbolically in these prophets about this end time, time that we are that we're in. Yeah, that we're going to and we're about to see even more of it just that, play out that like crazy. Start to make more sense when they as history plays itself out. You know exactly, and so in essence, we've got these things. These four carpenters or tradesmen now i'm going to take a little bit of a interesting line of thinking here and this is a little bit of feral conjecture which rhonda always gets nervous about <laughs> she, she, <does>. she, <laughs> she like, oh, always no. gets, oh, no. when i go down these <laughs> rabbit trails sometimes she's not comfortable with that but let's just move into it and see if you if you like where i'm going you have to explain why not everybody knows because I I really love to stick with the scriptures and and, well, and, and not get too far out there, right? Yeah, but I, I, I'm with you. I absolutely agree. And I know you are. Stay with the scripture. But sometimes you have to explore ideas in order to wrap your head around some scriptures. Some scriptures are a little hard to connect with because they're so cryptic right. in their right. nature. Anyway, in Zachar we moved to Zechariah 2. I lift up my eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. And he said, excuse me, and said I, where goest thou? And he said unto me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said, 
Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I saith the Lord, or for <clears throat> will be unto her a wall and a fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. So he's saying, hey, I'm gonna, you're going to major out Jerusalem, but I, I think you got to expand your thinking. It's not just the city. It's the nation. He's and kind of, def yeah, because he, he just said towns without walls. He didn't say just Jerusalem. So he's using Jerusalem more in a wide scale here, right. more like a nation. And so what is the original definition? And we kind of went that before. You notice that in the original definition, he said it's from the great river in Egypt to the great river Euphrates. That's all that land. That would include even what I believe to be the true Mount Sinai. It includes just in Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia and all kinds of land. And I'm going to go right into the scriptures. I'm actually going to jump into Deuteronomy and Genesis where these boundaries were laid out. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying unto thy seed, have I given this land from the river of Egypt? unto the great river, the river of the Euphrates. So there's the Genesis layout. But then he expanded into Deuteronomy. For it shall, for if you shall diligently keep all the commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to cleave to him, then will the Lord drive out of these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. So he's saying, if you if you live right, you're going to expand your boundaries. Now, we know in history they have never, Israel has never had from the Nile to the Euphrates. Every place wherein the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness of Lebanon, from the river of the river Euphrates, even in the utmost sea, shall your coast be. There shall be no man able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon the land that ye shall tread upon as he has said unto you. So yeah, I don't know if you've watched some of these videos on the, on the real Mount Sinai, but they actually drew around their footprints to show that they had been there right. in a lot of these ancient drawings and ruins. So, and, and in some ways, in the Sinai like, Peninsula, these, these, uh, etched footprints in the rocks are from that line right there that you just read that says every place wherein the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours and so these were kind of like land markers yeah they were they were claiming it right absolutely claiming it. and when you look at the the path they took and that's that's not including the part in egypt but this is just in the sinai peninsula where they crossed the red sea and came down in the caves of jethro and went up and around in the wilderness and round to Mount Sinai, they actually were marking their territory. It's kind of fascinating when you go and look at these these footprints uh, carved in the rocks. Footprints yes. carved in the rock. It's really, really fascinating to uh, see, and you realize that the Lord was serious about this, and and that's never been yet. So this has got to be future. Right. They still have yet to have. Now they took a, in David's time, they took much of it, but not all of it. Right. I mean, they, they probably had 60% of it, but not a hundred percent of it. So that's, and, and when you talk about the Abrahamic covenant, you were there in Genesis 12 and everything. You have to remember that the promises of the Abrahamic covenant are a promised land and posterity. And then the, the priesthood blessings that will bless the earth. But you can't have freedom. You can't have a kingdom unless you first have the promised Inheritance. land. The land, right? Yes, absolutely. So this is just kind of building to this promise we're talking about that, that Zechariah is redefining that, hey, this is going to happen. And if you believe, as I do, the time frame, this has got to happen pretty soon. I mean, this is... Right probably going to happen fairly quickly in the future of the next, you know, eight years area. You know, something's got to happen here soon, maybe even before that. Anyway, so <clears throat> go ahead and read this one, at least that first paragraph. 
O oh, oh, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwelleth with the daughter of Babylon. You know, right there, I'd like to pause just for a minute because it says they spread abroad as the four winds of heaven, and we actually know that that quite a bit of the house of Joseph spread up in into England and up in that area and then came to the Americas, as we all know by patriarchal blessings that we are from Ephraim. So in general, it's dual. Zion can be both, but I love to equate this Zion here that dwelleth with the daughter of Babylon. Hey, that's, that's Ephraim and Manasseh more than even the Jews because it's in Zion. And we know Zion is the way we referred to Jackson County and, and that area. So in essence, it says, O Zion that dwells with the daughter of Babylon, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, and he hath torched, or he toucheth you, and toucheth the apple of my, his eye. So it's telling us, get out of Babylon, for one thing, you know, as much spiritually at least. Well, and then also you have to remember Zion, I mean, we're kind of, narrowing this down geographically just a little bit which is all fine to do but there's also the broader sense there's also the zion that is a people the zion that's god's people exactly. that is scattered Art. amongst babylon which is the wicked of the world and here again we're setting this groundwork where you had the four horns that scattered you everywhere and now we're talking about the regathering in some sort of a political, economic circumstance that will reverse their curse of being scattered and they will receive the blessings of being gathered to a promised land. Yes, that's beautiful. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them and they shall be a spoil unto their servants and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Go ahead and pick it up and see. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee, and the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion, in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. So this is really awesome that he's telling us this is not just history. And the Jews are not uh, replaced by us. They and us have two different missions. And I thought it would be really fun right now to just look at Jerusalem in, in the sense of the old city. Um, I have a lot of fascination with yeah, the old this, city, this is especially your lately. Right here. And, yeah. <laughs> and I'm 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 taking a little rabbit trail here from from Zechariah to to my own personal experience when we were in Israel a little bit. And I told this story before, but I'm going to tell a little bit again here. That when I was in um, Israel and I was in the Garden of Gethsemane, I had a very spiritual experience. And in that time. I was enjoying the Garden of Gethsemane and its and its spirit and just absorbing in what was done there. And yeah. sitting amongst the ancient olive trees. Yeah, and these trees were 2,000 years old. I mean, they were there when he was there. Right. And I was just, just taking it all in. And I had this powerful experience where a voice spoke in my mind and said, turn and look. And it told me to turn and look west. And I was standing in the Garden of Gethsemane and I turned and looked west and there was the golden gates that you see here on the screen. And I realized at that point that Gethsemane and a straight line through the golden gates is to the Dome of the Spirits or Tablet. And it absolutely, the Spirit said, that is the place. And I was shocked and I just wept and I turned around and I says, I don't know why this just happened to me. 
You actually pulled me over and you said, look, turn around and look, look straight through the gate and what lines up straight with it. And when you see it lining up straight, and there, there's a lot of superstition the Arabs have about the Dome of the Spirits or the, or the tablet. And I realized that there are many who, who hold strong, there, well, there's three different thoughts. There's the one that holds to the thought that it's down in the city of David, which is down lower. And there's so much archeology span that they believe points to that, but it's actually the opposite. The archeologic actually points to the city of Salem, which is Melchizedek city and the symbols of Melchizedek. Um, and that was where Melchizedek was. Um, but if you tried to lay the dimensions of the temple over the city of David, you would be over top of, of, of houses and things that archeologically is not possible. Um, so either the temple was way smaller than it was, and it was just this little thing, or it couldn't be the city of David. And then you have the other train of thought that absolutely places the temple at the Dome of the Rock. And the Dome of the Rock is... I would say that's probably your more common. That's way. probably the mainstay of the, of the Jews' belief, um, is where the temple was. Um, and I've done tons of research on this, and I actually believe it's highly plausible that um, Ezra rebuilt the temple at the Dome of the Spirits just as it had been in Solomon's day. This is totally Pharaoh's conjectured idea. But when Herod ordered the temple to be rebuilt in 20 BC, which we know he did, and rebuilding of all of and the Herodian stones that are all over when he expanded Temple Mount, it would be impossible to rebuild Herod's temple in the exact same location. So it's my conjecture that he actually... As a construction person. As a construction person, that they build it right next to Ezra's temple so they could keep the sacrifices going. And then as soon as Herod's temple was done, they moved the sacrifices into Herod's temple. Now that's total conjecture on my side. Um, but it does make logical construction sense. But either way, I had a very powerful witness of the Spirit that it was at the Dome of the Spirits. And Rhonda just recently discovered a whole lot about temples that, that you had to be able to walk through the gates, and then through the gates of the temple, right through the gates of the Holy of Holies and all of it. So what, what I was researching was, because we have all the red heifers in Jerusalem, I was researching a lot about the offering of the red heifer and one of the things that just struck me is that when the priest that's offering the red heifer turns toward the temple and sprinkles the blood of the red heifer seven times he has to have a visual line of sight through four gates and they have to be in a straight line exactly through the the gate and and then through the um the the entrance to the tabernacle and he could actually see clear into the veil of the holy of holies as they were offering that red heifer and so that typology you think well does god care about that stuff absolutely detail absolutely matters and when I stood in Gethsemane, I realized it was a straight line through the gates to the Dome of the Spirits. And that's what the Spirit revealed. Now, you might say, well, how do we know the Golden Gates? Are the same place are the, that in the right they, place. They were, right. Yeah, how do we know the Golden Gates are in the right place? I mean, it was rebuilt after the Romans wiped it all out by the Turks. You know, and so did they build it in the right place? It wasn't really built by the Jews. Well, the answer to the question is in the archaeology. Okay. And when you realize that the Golden Gates were actually archaeologically found that they were built right on top of the original gates. And there's proof to that in every sense of the word because they've before the Arabs back in the 60s and early times before the Arabs got really, really uh, possessive of Temple Mount and making sure you couldn't do any archaeology around it, they had 
there were spots, and this guy has a personal account, where he walked to the Golden Gates, and right at the foot of the Golden Gates was a toll where this tomb shown on the screen. And he could see the bones and of people. And that's what we're going to see right here. And there's the top of the arch you're looking at right here with the bones in it that was a picture taken from back in that time frame. So we have the evidence of the top of the arch and the bones that show that it is built right on top of so does, the original gates. Does this have anything to do with the fact that that because the tradition was that the Messiah would return through these gates, they bricked the gates up, they bricked them closed, and because... Um, of this tradition, they also put a cemetery in the front. They tried to put Absolutely. all of the bones all of the and the dead people there so that it would be unclean, it would be defiled, and the Messiah couldn't enter through the gate. Yeah, so this, yes, and that's true. They, they so is that what that. these bones are? Well, we don't know exactly where the bones came from, but these were actually photographed back before they outlawed it. Now, because of all this... Before they outlawed what? Him going up there. And looking at it. Okay, so he took pictures you know, before he... 60, 80 years ago, okay. before this got to be such a hot potato. Okay, and then at that time, now you can see that they've actually covered it over. And they've fenced around it so you can't even get in and, and look at it anymore. So what he was showing you was pictures of the fact that these gates that were built by the Turks are exactly above the actual... Golden gates Golden of Gate Christ Day. Golden gates of Christ Day, right. Absolutely. And so. And that's important because when you were saying um, from the Mount of Olives, you were saying, look, you have to look straight through. Uh, that was my first question to you is, well, how do you know that that gate is built in the right place? Well, and now we have the evidence to show right. that what the Spirit told me is actually true, that they are built in the right place. Okay, now if you notice here in this rendition of the temple, that's exactly the way it's always showed in picture and in everything that the gates go straight through to the temple and just like the priests on the mount of olives so you see that directly across. you can see that it actually goes straight through to where the dome of the spirits or tablet would be so if you're at the place where they offer the red heifer across the kedron valley on the mount of olives to the east and you turn and you look directly through, through those the gates they they uh the records say that they actually had to have a direct line of sight through four gates. So. Which is fascinating now. Just play it forward and look how precisely God works. That means when he was in Gethsemane, because the gates would have been lower, he could have seen from the place of the atonement straight through into the Holy of Holies, or if the gates were open. That's just, that's the precision God well, it does. it was dark. Well, it was dark, but the point <laughs> is, the point is, is it the it's precision of fulfillment of these things is just fascinating. So I don't, I don't want to overdo that. That's just my little rabbit trap for a minute. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his, at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Or thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem, rebuke thee. Is not this the brand plucked out of the fire? Now that means, is not this my city that I will pluck out of the fire? I am going to protect it in this time. And so this restoration of, of the ancient kingdom of Israel is going to be complete in every way. It's not going to be just like we see today where it's, you know, kind of complete and there, but they're still, but it's going to get complete here. Now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. You actually put one of my favorite verses up there <laughs> because this is, this is actually a riddle. And in the Hebrew, the word that's translated men wondered at, <clears throat> it means these men are a sign. Okay? And, and this is actually a riddle that has to do with Joshua and his fellows in Zechariah. And it's, it's, 
it, we probably don't have time to go into it in detail today, but if you take the fellows that are listed in the book of Zechariah with him, and then you translate their names from the Hebrew, you have a code that talks about the church age and the, and the, the time of the grace of Christ right before this restoration. Right. So this is, this is cool stuff, and yet you, you go, is this relevant to my life? Well, it's going to be signs and wonders that are going to lay out in front of us in the next few years that are going to just be incredible to watch. Hopefully we'll still be able to watch. Um, so in the process of this, uh, go ahead and pick that up in, in Zechariah 6. Zechariah 6, oh, it's another good one. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up out of his place and shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Now, when you think about that, I know a lot of Christians, and I've studied many Christian perspectives and many LDS perspectives, believe the branch is Christ. Now, I ask... And he is on one level. Well, he is the ultimate symbol of all this message. All Davidic kings. But there is a branch. really couple of big questions you have to ask yourself in this, in this layout. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory. Now, if Christ is going to build the temple, he comes back to that. How does he come back? Yeah, that presents just that a built. little bit of a logistics right. yes. problem. Right. Okay, we have a logistics problem. So it begins to make you believe that this branch, the name is the branch, is not Jehovah or Christ. It's not the same individual. And then it says, and the council of right. peace shall be between them both, like two. The one that built it and the Lord. And the Lord. So this is not the same person. And yet it, it's kind of a John the Baptist character who kind of comes and and, and builds precurses, the temple for pre the Lord's return. Precurses the Lord's coming in when he comes on all of that. So I just wanted to bring that out so you see the clarity that that there has to be a little more to this story than we than see. just every prophecy see, in the end about, time is about Jesus' second yeah. coming, right? And the Jews, that's why they have a But little, it is kind of about his second yeah, it's, coming. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> kind of all the above in a way, but But we like to lump it all together, I think. Yeah. And and I think sometimes when you when you look at these things and you play it out in your head, you 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 don't understand the part of the reason why the Jews are having a hard time believing it's because we kind of ignore us from scriptures just like they kind of ignore us from scriptures. Right. Sometimes we're both ignoring scriptures that make us both go, ah, you're wrong. And they say, oh, you're wrong. And truthfully, the truth is probably in the blending of... In the whole. In the whole. I like that. It's a better description. In the whole of it. And that's beautiful. <clears throat> okay. Then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. Now this... This is a jumping back to Zechariah 5. I kind of went through the branch part and kept it together. But this is kind of an interpretation of this, and there's lots of different interpretations of all of this in Zechariah. Well, it's... Because it's so cryptic. Right, and the last thing that we want to come across as is, is that saying that answers. we have all the answers, because I don't think anybody has all the answers of what's going on in Zechariah. But... There's some pretty fascinating things we can talk about here. And as you get familiar with them, as it plays out, you'll see the answers more clearly as they kind of narrow in and you see them coming. Then I turned to lift up my eyes and looked, behold, a flying roll. And he said to me, what seest thou? I answered and said, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. What in the world is that? Okay. Um, I searched out some Christian commentators who believe the flying roll is a scroll because the word is almost the same word. So it's a big flying book or, you know, that's give you, but that's kind of out there. 
Uh, you know, it's kind of weird, and then it gives you a dimension. I lean another direction. I know, me too. <laughs> 20 cubits, the breadth of 10 cubits. Now, 20 cubits is approximately 30 feet, 30-something 30 feet. 10 cubits, if you went diameter, is pretty fat, but if you went circumference, it begins to take on more of a missile characteristic. <laughs> and I lean that direction. That this is more of a, a, a description oh, of a tubular yeah, It's talking about thing, a shape. And it actually gets more descriptive as you go on. Right. Okay. And the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thy eyes and see what is it that goes forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, It is an ephah that goes forth. An ephah is a measurement of stuff. Something is a quantity of an ephah, approximately. He said, moreover, there is a, a resemblance. that This is their resemblance through the, all the earth. So these are in a lot of places. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. What lead? Now our role is lead. Now we got a role that's got lead in it. What do you need lead for? Radiation? Huh? Yeah, I don't know. Is that right? Shielding. Does it, does it shielding. Radiation? Okay, it's shielding for radiation. Yes, you can shield radiation with lead. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sat in the midst of the ephah, this woman, which is kind of an interesting description. And he said, This is wickedness. Well, Nukes going off is can be quite wicked in its nature. And he cast it in the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth thereof. Are you going to talk about the woman? Go for it. I don't okay. Know. So in Hebrew, the word for woman is isha. Okay, it's aleph, sheen, hey. Okay. The word, if you take the hey off of the word and you just have the aleph in the sheen that is the word for fire ish oh that's right and so there are some scholars that have speculated that what this is talking about that's translated as woman here really is talking about a fire in the Weapon. midst a of big the lead fire. scroll. Yep, right? exactly. Great, great okay. addition there. This is wickedness and cast in the mist of the ephah, and he cast the weight and led upon the mouth thereof. The mouth thereof being the tip of the missile, and it all is set off. And there's in fire the inside. Yeah, now let's just A go measure forward. of fire. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked and beheld there came out two women and the wings was their, or excuse me, the wind was in their wings and they had wings like the wings of a stork. Hmm. Is that a picture of a missile? That is a cruise missile. Does it really have the wings on it like yes, that? Yes, they do. Then I said to the angel that talked with me, whether do these bear the El ephah? And he said to me, to build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it became established and set there upon its own base. So this is, guess where Shinar is, by the way? Babylon? Just a little more east. Mm. Iran. Oh, ow. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and this is getting kind of cryptic. Like, you know, this is stuff that judgment is going to be poured out by these... Um, tubular objects that fly over to and, and fold. Zachariah is describing these as, as being horribly wicked things. Yeah. Pretty. And, and we could be totally wrong. But yes, but it is a wow, fascinating interesting, take. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, fascinating take on what's going on here. And I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, and there came four chariots out between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of brass. Now, these four chariots that come out between two mountains, you know, there's a lot of scholars that speculate that's the Mount Zion and Mount of Olives. And I personally think that's a gong myself because they're not, there's no connection to brass for one thing. 
Right. Brass was um, Alexander the Great. Yeah, Hellenistic, it's Alexander. Right? It's the Greeks. It's the Grecian right. Roman culture. Right. So these two mountains are mountains that are coming out of, and you look to be how these two mountains come out of this Western culture, is the way I'm reading that. And as you read it, well, and chariots, you have to just remember in the, in the Bible, chariots are your your war weapons. They're war tanks. Weapons. You know? Yeah, they're, they're, they're the tanks of the, that day. Yeah, exactly. And now let's just look at it. The cryptic description here: the first chariots were red horses, and the second chariots black horses, and in the third chariot white horses, and the fourth ch chariot grizzled and bay horses. So he's, this is starting to sound a whole lot like the book of Revelation. Well, the, four, the first four seals yeah, in this Revelation is the chapter seal 6. Of Re, yeah, of the book of Revelation. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of heaven which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. So he's connecting this to a mindset. Yeah, as to the four us, spirits of heaven, meaning four mindsets, and he's not necessarily pattern. he's not necessarily saying this is a celestial heaven. He's oh, still, right. this is this is heaven, meaning the eons out there, kind of or whatever, and standing before the Lord of the earth. In other words, it is before him, but it's not necessarily um, it's not necessarily a celestial thing. It's a very telestial thing that we're oh, talking absolutely. about here. Okay, so now we're starting to get this imagery that's in the title of my presentation, The Four Horses of the Apocalypse. And we have, of course, the order is slightly different in Zechariah than it is in the book of Revelation. In Zechariah, the red horse, then the black horse, then the white horse, and the bay horse. So. It's kind of well. It says gristle, gristle than bay, right? It's yeah. kind of chi chiasmic in its, in its delivery in Zechariah, where you get the middle two before the outer two, and then you get the. Uh, you know what I mean? It's kind of fascinating, but you notice as you pull it here, and you notice most artists' re uh, renditions of this show the white horse and the bow that he carries being like a bow that shoots an arrow. Oh accept that as a plausible possibility. There is an idea out there. But I would like to present another line of thinking. Right. This bow comes from the same word that the rainbow is translated from, which gives you the idea that that was a sign of a covenant. So this bow, I lean towards. The other possibility is there too, and I'm not going to completely discount it. But this is a treaty kind of bow. So this white horse tries to solve the problem by treaty and by, and I kind of lean towards the fact that it's, it's definitely trying to create a deal. A deal. And I think that another, another support for that idea would be the fact that it never mentions an arrow. It only mentions Just the bow. bow right? Exactly. And then uh, it, it does it say something about peace in the in the Revelation? I think I think it does, and I've lost that particular thought in my head, so I can't draw that out just right this second. I can look it up real quick. <laughs> but why? Don't get too lost in there. But I wanted to now jump now that you kind of see that this is the the first mention of these four horses, but this time they're drawn chariots. This time they're they're definitely going to battle in Zechariah, but they're going to battle in Revelation too. It's just the difference between Zechariah describing them and John, I believe. But anyway, let's go back to this idea of between two mountains. What in Scripture is a kind of a first mention of two mountains? Well, we have. The two mountains they had to pass through. I'm going to say, you're talking uh, about Ebal and Gerizim? Yes, exactly. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you to do this day, to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee out of the land, whither thou goest to possess it, 
that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. So wow. this symbology well, I think is judgment. It's oh, absolute absolutely. judgment. And so what you're talking about is these chariots come out and it's judgment. And if you are found in covenant with God and obeying him, then you're on the good side of this judgment. But if you're found on the bad side of this, then you're on the bad side of this covenant. And that's when those four that horses. beautiful between the two mountains. Because yes. throughout scripture, passing between two mountains, between the pieces, is a symbol of the both the curses and, and the, the blessings. blessings of the covenant and that's exactly what the four horsemen of the apocalypse are going to do they're going to sort it all they're going to sort the evil that. and the bad and the good mm -hmm. the good and the evil they are going to be about cleansing the land that's their purpose and and i've always i this is my spec oh i'm gonna speculate oh no, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay but conjecture I, yes i i've kind of felt like that this series you know when you have when you have this attempt for um it, it said in revelation that, that there's, it's given a crown and to conquer but i've always looked at it as kind of this attempt to govern the world without god to to man's attempt to have peace and to conquer and to and to govern um but that follows war the red horse that follows that and then after war, you, uh, the famine of the of the black horse, and then after that, the sickness and death from disease. This is kind of a natural series of events that kind of happens naturally. And so, the, my four my spirits. kind of idea, my kind of idea is that these four horsemen, or now, that they that just let me, I'm almost done that they represent the consequence of doing it without God. Yes. But Naturally. Now, put it in the context of four carpenters. They're four craftsmen wow. that have a particular job. Those in, are mean craftsmen. <laughs> they have a particular job. And what did it say back when we started? They to, gather. No. To take out the Gentile nations that have been oppressing right. Israel. Mm -hmm. The yeah. whole job of these four horsemen <coughs> is to to sort it all out, right? So that Israel can again be the head of the to cleanse the land, so that yes, they can inherit exactly. The land. So let's go to the Revelation version of this. That and I saw the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, this peace deal, probably orchestrated by the Antichrist, he will get a crown because of it. He will get leadership of the world. He will get the praise of the world. Revelation, he will get all of it. Revelation says that the, the ten horns rule with him for one hour with the yes. beast. He sets so up these, these leaders. This white horse character, by treaty, becomes into power. And then he gets very wicked later, you know, with his breaking of the treaty and everything. And when I opened the second seal and the second beast saying, come and see. And there went on another horse that was red and power was given him that sat there upon to take peace from the earth. And that there were should kill one another and there shall given unto him a great sword. Interesting in the description. Um, so what we have is first off by treaty, then by war. And then we go to the next. I mean, so the white horse being treaty, the red horse being war. Now let's just go and let's go to the third seal. And when he had opened the third seal, and I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld a lower black horse, and he that sat him up had a pair of balance in his hand. And I heard the voice in the midst of him, the voice saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou not hurt the oil or the wine. So there's famine, and the and food is... So this horse of famine and that kind of thing is caused by inflation. Now, I don't know about you, but you could make a pretty good argument that a lot of these 
horses are already out to trot. They're already, <laughs> They're already out to trot. We've already had treaties. Um, We've already had war. What it says in Zachariah been, that they're going to and fro through the land. I heard another another Christian preacher speculate that these horses and these these ideas or these these spirits were spirits of government, like democracy and communism and wokeism and the different perspectives and i'm not gonna pharmaceuticals yeah and, i'm not gonna play a lot of weight on that and she's yeah. giving me a funny face like yeah. she doesn't buy into that a little, but it I'm, is i'm not saying it's wrong i'm just saying i don't think that's the main and i don't either but it is fascinating to note that most of the peace treaties come by democracy and most of the um, war comes by um, communism. communism, and most of the uh, most of the um, other things you know, that cause trouble in the world comes from inflation, which comes from wokeism and so-called battle cries of equal rights that are done upside down and backwards, and they aren't about equal at all. You know they've pointed out these different thoughts and this equality thing and all the different places that go and then you get your your science being the pale horse trying to do everything and then ends up destroying everybody with their plagues which is kind of there anyway and i looked and beheld a pale horse pale horse and his name that sat him when he was death now that word pale is actually comes from the greek word chloris and it's more of a sickly green just so you know. Just ah. imagine someone getting ready to vomit and you say, you're, you're going green. You know? Yeah, exactly. And so it's it's plague. And so that, that pale horse is plague. And we're seeing all of these start to play out in our world today. So it's not like this is hard to even see now. Um, and his name that sat on was death and hell followed after him. And power was given over him to do a fort to a fourth part of the earth and killed with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. The beasts mm -hmm. of the earth always represent governments. Can be both. Well, I mean, but literally it could be yeah, animals. Yeah, it can be but, both. But what I'm saying is that your beasts in The symbolically. beast being, yeah, but it is the beast of the earth. And, and, you know, you can see it all playing out. This doesn't take a big stretch anymore. You know, years ago you'd sit there and you could have ask yourself, well, how's this going to play? But it's already playing out. And I think I think that what we're doing is, in, in having this conversation, is just trying to get um, to help other people be able to grasp the symbolism of it so that they can see this prophetically coming to pass, where we're not trying to define it or restrict it. We're trying to give ability to understand what was trying to be presented you know and i i think going back to this idea of democracy and i know democracy is held up as the ultimate form of government but in reality um if the majority choose wickedness then a democracy is not a good thing right it's spoken of in the book of ether not it says the righteous yeah, yeah when when the majority choose wickedness we're in trouble so yeah a a Republic, democ or a democracy that is a republic or whatever, can still only rule a righteous people. And many of the founding fathers were very clear that this government is only sufficient to rule a moral people. A moral people. Right. Um, and you can obviously see where it's ending without a moral people. Uh, <clears throat> Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. This is now we're getting right to the end of everything. A cup of trembling unto the, all people around about, and they shall be a siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So this is, now we're progressing into the Gog, Magog, Armageddon. The scenario. final battle. Yeah, we're headed in the final battle here at the end of Zechariah. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. So right there at the end, Israel's going to really start to turn back to God. And they're, they're really going to start saying, hey, we need divine intervention. In that day, I will make governors of Judah, 
Judah, like the hearth of a fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheath, and they shall devour all people around about. So they're going to hit them hard around them, and the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in their own place, even in Jerusalem. So that's this early war we're talking about, and then we're going to progress into the later war. That's, that's the... Uh, the Ezekiel 35, 36 scenario in Psalms 83. And then we're going to move forward and we're going to see the Ezekiel 38, 39, Gog, Magog scenarios. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Okay, so we're progressing right here to the very end scene right here in Zechariah. It's amazing. Do you realize Zechariah came right on the tail end of Daniel? He actually kind of was in the in the quorum, if you want to call it that, right after Daniel. So, you know, he is literally well, the one that's involved in the going back and getting the temple going. And historically whole, in context, historically. Daniel is praying, you know, we've been in captivity for 70 years. When are we going to be released? And that's when he has his vision. Well, Zachariah is going to be right one there. of them that's going back. Yeah, right? he's going back at the 70-year scenario in, in Cyrus's time and everything. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. Now we're under the Gog Magog scenario. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. The residue is the remnant that's left, and that's going to be a third, and it's very clear later on that it's a third. Two-thirds get wiped out. That's the time of trouble like none other. And the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. I was just going to go to DNC 133 where it, it says that, and Jerusalem after her pain will be sanctified and holy before the Lord. Yeah, and we're and, about to get yeah. there in, in full color here. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Now we're at the rescue of Jerusalem, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall move towards the north and half the mountain to the south. So it's literally going to split right in half from east to west and probably split the wall right down the gate, oh my the golden gate. To the gate. Huh? Okay, it's going to split the wall right to the golden gate. And he shall flee to the valley of the mountain and the valley of the mountain shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as if you flee before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king, is that Uzziah that? king of Judah, yeah. And the Lord my God saying. shall come and all the saints with thee. Didn't you hear what it just said? It says he comes and he brings all the saints with him. And if you read in DNC 133, that's the 144,000 come back with him. Boom, boom. This is the, we're getting to the climax well, if you read scene here. There, there in, in DNC 133 too, you, you, you actually get some perspectives that are so cool if you get time just read, read 133. 133 it talks about the whole earth being shifting at, at this particular time quite the earthquake right and then um and then dnc 45 gives the the actual words that... okay so now let's move into chapter 14 and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark kind of dusky but it shall be one day which shall be known to the lord not day nor night but it shall come to pass that all the evening time it shall be light what they just said is we're going to have a repeat of samuel of, the, the prophet of, of, of the america's samuel, version the Lamanite, right? yeah the day, day and night and the day yes. it's going to happen again it happened at his first coming it's going to it happen in his second, second coming that's just beautiful the types and shadows that replay and it shall be in that day that the living water shall go forth or go out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea, which is, and to, and half of them toward the hinder sea, the summer and the winter shall be. So half towards the Dead Sea and heal it and half towards the Mediterranean. That's the way I'm understanding that. Yeah, that's Okay, it's because of that rift that goes right down east to west, mm -hmm. you know, and it kind of splits it all there and it changes the whole landscape there. 
<clears throat> and, and the Lord, they, go ahead. They actually know that, that that earthquake is going to have to change the topography because the way the temple is described to be built in Ezekiel couldn't happen on the geography that's there exactly right now. Exactly, which is fascinating when you consider 133 and the whole topography of the uh -huh. earth is going to change. Right. Which is, and the Lord shall be king over the earth and the day shall there be a one Lord and his name one. And men shall dwell in it and there shall no more utter be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. So after all this, you get your Cinderella story. Happy ever after, you know, we're going to get the whole deal now. Now, you thought I wasn't going to hit Haggai. What? <laughs> <laughs> Before you go to Haggai, um, I, I just wanted to, well, I, I won't read it. I'll just mention it in DNC 45 where you, uh, that, dip, that moment when they're passing through between the pieces, again, between the mountains. Covenant pieces, time. It's the covenant time, and they, they look on him and they say, who are you? And Jesus said, I am he. Who? who was slain in the house of my friends, and then they weep. And that's when the last of the people in Jerusalem get it. Yep, that's when the this last is, of Judah. That's it. just the house of David. such an incredible <coughs> passage of Scripture and point of time. Now we get our millennial picture starting to come into view. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord to the prophet Haggai. What day is that? Seventh month. Oh, it's the last day of tabernacles. Yeah. Woo! So this is saying in the last day of tabernacles, which is the, what do they call that? The, the uh, last, the last day. The great, well, the great last day is the one, eighth day. The eighth day is the great and last day. The seventh day is the last day. Right. Like um, <laughs> in the last day, the, the, yeah, this so will happen. This is scripture. the kind of the last day of the wedding feast of tabernacles. Yes. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the oh, earth wait. and the sea and the dry land. We have to tell them that on the last day, this is the biggest celebration. It's the grand finale of, of the Feast of Tabernacles. They're yep. doing all the fire dancing. Yep. And and you know. it, yeah, so this is the big celebration. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house. It's talking the temple now. With glory, saith the Lord of hosts, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts, and the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. He's saying that this is the whole deal, that it's going to be bigger and more wonderful than ever before in the Feast of Tabernacles at the end. Okay, and then... He goes on in 14 and say, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is in the left of all nations, which come against Jerusalem. In other words, if they aren't completely wiped out, everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to which the king of the Lord of hosts and keep it on the feast of tabernacles. So that's connecting back to Haggai saying that that's when they're going to come and, and give reverence to this time. When Christ saves them and has the wedding feast, in the day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness to the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and see us there the end. And in the day they shall no more the Canaanite be in the house of the Lord. Okay, so this we know all over our temples. We have holiness to the Lord, the house of the Lord. And this will be in Jerusalem. This will be on the horses. We will live to that day. I, I, I just wanted to add one more phrase from Haggai too. I think this is my favorite phrase in Haggai. And it says, um, and I will shake all the nations and the desire of all nations will come. That's so they, my, my favorite phrase right there. I just want so to they're all it. going to, to yield and say, hey, we did it wrong. It's all messed up. We'll do it your way. Jesus Christ we'll is the desire 
of all nations, yep. and he'll come. All that are left. Yeah. The remnant that is left. Okay, so now we know in the timeline here, you go forth and you realize that that great event happens at Yom Kippur, which is the Day of the Atonement, and then an the day that Israel is redeemed. In the day that Israel is redeemed, and then an increment of five later, we have a Feast of Tabernacles going on. The and whole millennial the, wedding feast. Yeah, and the whole yeah. wedding supper, and the whole thing goes on, and and we get to see this whole event taking place right in that time frame. So, wonderful things to look forward to. Awesome Old Testament. Awesome Old Testament. It's hard to believe that this is all in there. Oh. And that you have all this prophetic picture of these of these prophets of the minor prophets, as we call them, that give us such a beautiful picture of how this all sums up and how all of these pieces come together. And there's there it more. Is. We didn't get it yeah, all. Yeah, we can't. We can't possibly do we, it. We missed the we Antichrist. The, yeah, we missed description at the end of chapter eleven and all that. But you know, you, you just got to do your reading. Yeah, that's just that's your uh, commercial. <laughs> you can go get it yourself. Just get in there and dig. And that's the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And the restoration. Zechariah style and a full restoration of Israel at the Mount of Olives. And that's when all of it gets restored. Both the old Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem all will be working in it in conjunction. And happy holidays. And yeah, happy holidays. And it's so good to the be able to just nations, yes. share with you. So till next time, God bless. Blessings.